You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast produced by Veteran Strategies and featuring conversations with fascinating and impactful men and women who have shaped our world, our communities, and our history. My name is Robert Vane, Principal of Veteran Strategies, and your host for our discussion. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel, Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. You can find all of your sales and rental equipment needs at McAllister.com. We also should thank Wish TV, partner of the Leaders and Legends podcast, and you can find us on the All Indiana Podcast Network at allindianapodcastnetwork.com. Thank you for joining us on the Leaders and Legends podcast today. Our guest is a true racing and Indianapolis legend. We all rooted for him. We all hoped he would win. And that is three-time Indianapolis 500 champion, Johnny Rutherford. Lone Star JR, we are thrilled. Well, thank you very, very much. It's my uh, my honor to be here and talk about racing. <laughs> well, I guess there's no better place to talk about it. We're actually right now sitting in the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum. Uh, and just walking through it very quickly, it's amazing how well done this museum is. Are there some things from your career that are around here somewhere that you get to peek at from time to time? Occasionally, yes. There are a few things. In fact, I recently uh, sent them a uniform and the helmet that I was wearing when I won in 1980. And uh, I think some gloves and shoes or something, you know, to put on a mannequin. I haven't seen it yet, but uh, uh, they tell me that it's there. But this is a magnificent place to, to visit, to see the cars that have done the things they've done over the years. And, and up on this main floor, uh, you know, they have the, the most current cars and what's going on. But you get to go to the basement. If you can wangle a, chore, a, a trip to the basement, <laughs> boy, it is really something for somebody that is a historian of racing. What's down there? What are some of the things you see? All the cars that they can't get upstairs. And they're, you know, old uh, passenger cars above the 20s and and uh, some race car sprint cars, some midget race cars and things that they they rotate them every, you know, every now right. and then. But, but it's uh, still, uh, you know, they, they've got a ma- marvelous collection of cars here at the museum. Well, the Leaders and Legends podcast has hosted Mark Miles and Allison Melangdon and Donald Davidson, all members of the Speedway hierarchy and executive staff. We talked a lot about the race, and we were really wanting to talk to a racer. Uh, the calendar actually, despite the postponement, favored our chances of getting a race car driver. Johnny Rutherford, uh, who wasn't born in Texas, but carries a lot of Texas heritage uh, is one of only a few men to win the Indianapolis 500 three or more times. His victories came in 74, 76 and 80. And he won the pole in 73, 76 and 80. Before I ask you a whole bunch of questions, the first question I wanted to ask you was when I was doing this research, what was it like to win the pole and win the race in the same year, twice. Well, that's what we came here to do, <laughs> to to uh, do the best we could in, in all of the events. And pole position is one of them. And then, of course, the race is the other one. But I'm, I'm proud of a situation like in 74, I came here, had fast enough time to to start on the on at least the middle of the front row. A.J. Foyt and I were battling for... Uh, the pole position and I was driving for McLaren and uh, uh, we 
had a chance, qualified on qualify morning, we lost an engine. We scuffed a piston, and the guys rushed the car back to the garage, changed the engine in 58 minutes, came back out, put it in line, and Tom Benford was the new chief steward that year here. And he said, no, I, the rules changed. said, uh, you've got to go to the end of the line. So we had to go to the end of the line, and I qualified, and, and the, the way the pit, the, the qualifications were set up. I qualified for pole in the ninth row, 25th starting spot. <laughs> and I had the second fastest, as it turned out, second fastest car in the field. Well, when they dropped the green flag race day, I started in 25th, and in 12 laps, I was running third. That's huh. how good my car was. And then I hooked up with A.J. Foyt, and we battled for, oh, I don't know, probably a third, fourth of the race, just hammer and tong. And he uh, lost an oil line on his engine and been put him out of the race, and I went on to win my first first race. And so when you see him after that race, what does he say? Congrats, J.R., or daggummit, oh, I, you're lucky. I can't use the language that he uses. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> How does a kid from Coffeyville, Kansas, born in 1938, the, the automobiles were just coming into their own, how does a kid from Coffeyville, Kansas, become so in love with cars and racing that that's what you want to do for your living? You know, it. I enjoyed, uh, you know, as a youngster, you know, bicycling. We used to ride bicycles and and make soapbox derby type cars and things, you know, and, and, uh, that, but I was probably eight years old when my dad on a Saturday evening took me to the fairgrounds in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where we lived at the time to see the midgets run and midget racing after the war was, was the, the big thing because fans were, eager to be able to do something besides stay home and and look at ration books you know yeah that's a great point and so the midget racing was really really big you know all over the united states and the southwestern circuit which uh, included oklahoma city tulsa houston dallas uh wichita kansas uh you know it was a big circuit and you could run somewhere every night and uh but anyway, uh, he took me out to the midget car races, and I was immediately hooked. <laughs> I Those little brightly colored, chrome-glinting little cars going around the track was something I would really like to do. And so when I was eight or nine years old, I, I said, that's it. I, I want to drive race cars when I grow up. And your parents said? Said, uh, oh, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my dad my dad knew because he was he was an adventuresome sort his his life was aviation mm. he was a he was a great air aviation an aircraft mechanic engine mechanic is in in uh, particular and uh, he he liked racing and and we had in fact he bought a midget race car and and uh, race didn't he didn't race it, but because, because my mother wouldn't allow him to, <laughs> but uh, he hired you know would hire a driver to to drive the car and but anyway uh, so I got to sit around in the in that in the garage when you know between races and and uh, play like so uh, anyway I I uh, just you know, always wanted to be a race driver. Well, and that, that sort of father son dynamic is, is very famous with AJ Foyt Jr. AJ Foyt Sr. It sounds like you kind of had the same situation with your dad. Similar. Yes. Very similar. Uh, he was chief of maintenance for the Oklahoma air national guard right after the war. Hmm. And it was a 125th fighter squadron P-51 Mustangs they had. And uh, so I not only got to sit in the race car on occasion, I got to, he let me get up in the cockpit of a P-51 and uh, play like, you know. I was flying, couldn't <laughs> hardly see over the, the rail, side rails. But uh, 
that <clears throat> I always like race cars. I always enjoyed aviation and piloting, and I got my pilot's license, and I have owned two P-51 Mustangs, and I've got over probably 200 hours of Mustang flying time all over the United States in my P-51, and uh, uh, so I, I fulfilled a lot of want-tos in my life, but wanting to be. It seems that the speed, the need for speed, to quote Top Gun, uh, 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 is something that unites race car drivers and pilots and 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 tests you know speed test and and uh, kind of daredevils for lack of a better term you you got your race car sp- speed fix now you needed your aviation speed fix and i can only imagine how fast the p51 flying and that is Did, were there similarities between very, flying that and then being in a car going 200 very, miles an hour very much so because of the intensity of of both you know you've got to you got to really focus in a race car and and uh you know or it'll it'll lateral g will put you into the fence and that'll be the end of it uh aviation is lateral not much lateral g but mostly vertical g you know and so it's it's different you know but it's the p51 you really had to pay attention to and uh, you know, I I enjoyed that very much. Just was it, was it um, there was a local, I forget the guy's name. Who's the, Tom Wood? Tom Wood, the local yeah, car Tom guy. Was, he had Tom a P fifty one. He had yeah. several planes. Yeah, he was a dear friend, and and uh, he passed away a few years ago. And and uh, anyway, I you know, it just we there were those of us that liked that sort of thing, and still do. How important was it when you were, especially when you were younger and driving to understand engines and gears and all the technical aspects of the car? Was it important for you to be able to talk cars, quote unquote, with the crew and the crew chief, as opposed to you do your thing and I'll drive and you just get it ready? A little bit of both, I think. Uh, As the driver, uh, you take what they they have set up for you and go out and see if it's, you know, what you want. And uh, that was the that was the thing with with McLaren racing that Tyler Alexander and I hit it off. And we being able to talk with your crew chief or whoever uh, is is putting the thing together and making it happen uh, is ex- essential. You've got to have that connection in in uh, racing or it doesn't work and uh, tyler was was you know he understood what i was saying and i understood what he was telling me that he was going to do the race car and when we that way we got it straightened out today they have engineers it takes 16 guys with laptops to put one of these race cars together (laughs) And to me, that kind of defeats the, the purpose of the of the business in the first place. Uh, you mentioned laptops, and I'm laughing because all I can think of is the visual of AJ Foyt throwing the laptop. In yes, the, yeah, sailing did you, it did, like did you a start frisbee, laughing like a frisbee across the racetrack. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it, it's it's different. I realize time marches on and things happen, but. Uh, to me, that's taken a lot of the a lot of the excitement for a driver out of it. Uh, I you know maybe I'm all wrong, but but uh, to see what they have to go through and the changes they make, and they can bring it out and try to fire it up, and it it won't fire up for three times, and they've got to get the laptops out and hook them into the th- right things and mm-hmm. see what's wrong. You know, well, uh, it was either the engine wouldn't start. Well, it was either the magneto or you know some right. simple things and now it's it's a, a major a major uh, thing to do do you remember when you first became aware of the indianapolis motor speedway and the indianapolis 500 oh gosh i was probably you know i'm i'm trying to recall with the whether the whether the radio uh, carried the race on national uh, stations or not i uh i remember once probably when i was 10 or 11 years old listening 
uh, to the radio broadcast of the Indianapolis 500 with my dad. And I think any driver here was that way unless they're from across the pond and they never knew about the Indy 500. I remember being in the Army in New Mexico and it was race day and I turned on ABC or turned on the TV knowing that, oh, you know, I guess we'll just see when the race is going to get broadcast and it was live. It was the first time I saw it live on television because I'd never been out of Indianapolis and it was one of the great discoveries of my life. I'm like, oh my God, I can sit here and watch this now. And talking to some of the folks I was stationed with because they were used to watching it live. They didn't understand that it was, you know, tape delayed here or blacked out. But a lot of them talked about it, watching it as a kid and how gigantic the event itself was. When you came here the first time, did you come here as a fan or did you come here as a driver? I was a, <clears throat> pardon me, fan driver. I was racing, just starting my racing career in Dallas, Texas at the Devil's Bowl Speedway. And uh, <laughs> What a name. Yeah, it was something. But anyway, I uh, came with, with friends that I raced with there. Uh, Jim McElreath, who was a rookie of the year here in 61. And anyway, I came up in 1960, and that was the race when Roger Ward and Jim Rathman put on a duel. I think they changed the lead over 50 times during the event. Mm. And uh, Jim Rathman won it, but uh, we were had a spot on the backstretch and to watch the race, and it was... Uh, you know, wow, Indianapolis Motor Speedway. I got the cold chills that you get coming through the gate into the place, and uh, I do every time. You know, this is I'm back. You know, you who it seems to, and we've got a lot of things to talk about, but I want to stay on this point just for a second. It does just seem to be different. I mean, you've been to Daytona and Michigan and Pocono and all these racetracks from dirt all the way to IMS and I'm sure you've been to places. I know you've been places overseas to race. You get the chills here. Do you get the chills when you walk in other places? Only one other place, maybe not as bad, but it was Darlington. I was running some NASCAR, uh, during that early period of my switch over from sprint cars and the, and the uh, uh, circuit in the fair, the fair circuit. And I, you know, uh, had a ride in a stock car after I did my thing with Smokey Eunuch at Daytona in, in 63. And, and uh, Darlington was always, you know, that was the, the first place that first major speedway that NASCAR had. And all mm. everything else was dirt or short pavement or whatever. And, uh, I, I got, got that feeling going in there because that, you know, of what it was sure. the same it to it to NASCAR was what this is to Indy car racing. Not did quite you, as big, but did you forge some friendships in those NASCAR years that, and I, cause I remember being a kid and looking at the the photos in the star, obviously, or Sports Illustrated or whatever, where the NASCAR drivers would come to Indy during the month of May to see. Uh, did you get to be really good friends or enjoy watching the racing of a Richard Petty or a Cale Yarborough, Darrell Waltrip, that sort of generation? And all of those guys you named. We're, we're good friends. Uh, I saw Richard... Oh, a year ago in uh, in good at Goodwood in England, and uh, we got to sit and talk quite a bit and reminisce about the early days, of, you know, of NASCAR. And uh, but uh, yes, I all of those guys uh, became you know dear friends. When I went there with Smokey Eunuch in '63, I had never driven a late model stock car, a stock car. Period. Mm. I had raced sprint cars on half mile dirt tracks. And uh, the biggest track I'd ever been on was a mile, and it was dirt. So I went to, I don't, I, you know, I didn't find out till a few years later why Smokey hired me. But anyway, uh, 
I went down there and, and, uh, uh, he, they fitted me in the car when I got there and got ready, went out the track the next day. And he said, you know, you're going to need somebody to, to help you with questions about this place. I said, I'll be right back. And he went away in about 10 minutes. He came back with two guys in tow. And my tutors for the my first Daytona 500 were Fireball Roberts and Joe Weatherly. Joe Weatherly was the reigning champion that year. And so, it, you know, it was good. Little Joe had was having trouble with his car and uh, it wasn't a, that much help to me. Uh, but Fireball did, you know, point out a few things about the track and, and the wind where, where it might be a problem. And, but it was, it was fun, enjoyable. You know, very enjoyable. I'm not sure how much faster Indy cars were running in the 70s, maybe early 80s, than NASCARs. But when the, the NASCAR drivers would come here, were you like, hey, why don't you try to get in this car? And why don't you drive my chaparral? And then you can actually feel what speed is like. Was there a little trash talk going on? Like, <laughs> you're riding, you're driving around in those station wagons there at Dar- yeah, Daytona. No, why don't no. you come get in this thing? No, no. <laughs> no trash talk uh other than uh kale and i became became dear friends still are and he he uh would get on about his stock car this stock car that and i'd say damn it kale we tow our cars to the racetrack with the kind you race <laughs> oh that would get him upside down but it, <laughs> it was it, you know it's it's just you know different Good natured ribbon yeah and they're, they're race cars now. You know, they have developed into their race cars, heavy race cars. And I think that's on its way out. I think they're going to change that. Those things will go 200 mile an hour around Michigan and uh, or 204, 5, whatever it is. But the Indy cars will go 30, 230, right. you know. And so that's there's a difference. It's going to be a difference, different kind of racing. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel, Grand Hall, and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Thank you for joining us on the Leaders and Legends podcast. Our guest today is three-time Indianapolis 500 champion, Johnny Rutherford. You came to Indianapolis. Your first start is in 1963. Yep. Is it possible that your most important victory occurred in 1963? I think so. And uh, what am I referring to? Referring to the fact that I met my wife to be Betty. Uh, Betty Hoyer from Osgood, Indiana. And uh, she passed uh, a little over a year ago. And it was, it's really been hard for me to, uh, to, you know, get around that because she was. She was the cornerstone of our family, and she was, you know, she was a registered nurse, had graduated from Methodist School of Nursing, and uh, was a smart lady. She could have been a doctor if she had chosen to be a doctor, you know. And so, but uh, dementia got her, and and she just finally, after a little over three years, it, it she just drifted away and, and didn't know anything or anybody or and it was, it's really sad, and uh, it's been not easy for me because of, of the relationship we had, and we were, she was, she was the center of the, of the universe for me. Married for 55 years. Yep. Your first race is 1963. What was it like to go from being outside the fence as a fan to inside the track as a driver? Well, it, a little bit of a little bit of pressure because of you know things that you don't know about the place, you know, and the the things that you don't know about going as fast as we were going uh, back then. 
Uh, I think I qualified that first year at 148 miles an hour. How fast were you going in sprint and dirt car, stock car? Stock cars, 165 at Daytona. So it was, you know, different. Sure. Different. And, uh, but I, you know, to come here uh, and and go through my driver's test. In fact, it was during the fourth phase of my driver's test. You have to go so many miles an hour and not go so many miles over or any four miles, so many miles under. And so it was, you know, see if you could control a car and what you could do. And uh, I was on the final phase of my driver's test, and uh, we were pushing the car out <clears throat> to uh, on the pit lane. And I just leaned over and dropped my helmet in the seat, and we had to go all the way back to the north end of the pits because that's where the tests were staged from. And I looked up, and at the fence was this cute little blonde. So, I mean, she was, you know, I wow. And uh, she was always a cute little blonde. Yeah, a cute little blonde. Anyway, anyway, she was looking at me, and I winked at her, and she winked back. Later, she changed, the, and she said, I told that story, and she said, no, no, I, I waved back. <laughs> so, anyway, we pushed off down to the down to the north end and got ready, and I went out, and we had a problem Uh and I came in, and uh, uh, we had to wait till the next day to finish the test. And so I uh, started back through Gasoline Alley to into the garage area, and there was a first aid station right there uh, where Goodyear wound up being. And uh, uh, she was standing outside. I had no idea she was a nurse, and she was standing talking to some friends in the door. And the first words I ever said to her in my life were, haven't I seen you someplace before? <laughs> now, is that something? Anyway. It worked. It worked. It did. And I, I asked her, you know, she gave me her phone number, but I said, How you, I'll take you out to dinner tonight. She said, no, I have plans. Well, I found out later she was making sure that I wasn't married, you know, and just, right. you know, separated my wife would be home and I'm here. But uh, anyway, no, she found out. And and uh, so we started dating. And uh, that was the first part of May. And uh, we were engaged the first part of June and got married July the 7th in 1963. Wow. And, and uh, you know, we had to find a day when we weren't, when I wasn't racing to be able to get, have a marriage. So, and the, the, trials and tribulations and fears i mean they're perks too obviously but but all those sorts of things that come with being a race car driver's wife she handled them with grace and class and courage yes she did for a fact and uh you know during that period uh in the in the 60s and and uh into the 70s uh, we lost a lot of friends you know people in racing and and so it yes, you're right. It's uh, one of those things that you just you know if you're going to do it, you you gotta you know if you worry about it, you might not you shouldn't be out there, right? So uh, you know it's not going to happen to me is the old adage. Well, one of the things that I read when I was going through your career the last few days, and obviously I have a frame of reference. I was born in '67, so as I was growing up, you were in your heyday, but. Uh, this was mentioned in two or three articles that I had read, and that is your wife, Betty, looking on from the pits when you won in 74 was an important moment in Indianapolis Motor Speedway history because I read in two or three different places that it, there was a superstition in American racing about women being in the pits, but she saw you win from right there. What was it like? And when you pull into victory lane the first time in 74 and there she is, do you remember that moment? Oh yeah. Yes. It's, you know, that <clears throat> you are so happy and excited about the fact that you've taken the checkered flag first and you're, you know, pulling up into victory lane. And that is, 
the part that probably means more to you than not is is for your your family or your wife to be there to you know when you pull into victory lane uh that can only happen once you know pulling into victory lane and betty to be there was perfect you know that's it's the way it goes what does cold milk taste like on a 90 degree day <laughs> well does it, it tastes good because you win or yeah, does it like oh, it, god it, give me something yeah. else i i should have been like uh uh louis meyer and and ordered buttermilk because that would have tasted better but milk <laughs> is milk you know and but buttermilk would, it would have i like buttermilk and it it would have been but that's uh yeah you know uh that's only that only happens once unless you do it a second time, and that's the second time it's happened to you. And then the third time is the third time it's happened to you. And and it's, uh, you know, part of being there, doing what you love to do most. Your second race is famous slash infamous, and you were right in the middle of it. You and I talked a little bit about it uh, on the phone uh, last week. Because my brother, Michael, who's a gearhead and a pilot, an actual airline pilot for Republic, who uh, I don't think attended a day of school in the month of May from 1973 to 1979, because he was here with his buddy, Scott Remke. The wreck involving Eddie Sachs and Dave McDonald, you were right in the middle of it. Yeah. Talk to us, please, about what you remember from that. And how Eddie Sachs's lemon ended up in your engine? Well, the the entire sequence of events is uh, imprinted in my mind, and I you know I could close my eyes and see it happening again. But uh, it was. You know, it started that had that had all happened a second lap, and uh, so when the race <clears throat> the race started, Sachs I think was beside me or on the inside. I was outside in the fifth row, and he was uh, inside maybe or or though. And uh, Davy McDonald was the row behind us, and the green flag came out, and we went into the first turn, and Eddie <clears throat> in his rear engine car lighter weight probably went in front of me and i thought ah that's good eddie always goes to the front i'll just see if i can hang on to him and uh, so we go around and make the the next lap and and uh coming in just getting through the first turn there's a car that's making uh, angry noises <laughs> comes by me and it was it was dave mcdonald and he was, you know, it was yeah, yeah, and, and he was, it was bouncing around, and and uh, he got in, into the grass a little bit, and you know, kicked some stuff back, and and uh, I thought, boy, there goes the guy. It's either going to win this thing or crash. And uh, went down the back straightaway, and uh, he, that's the way David drove. I'd seen him in st in sports cars, and he didn't mind getting sideways well he was going a lot slower in a sports car so anyway mm -hmm. that it, that was part of it we go down the back stretch and around the third turn and start across the short chute and and as we get to the right at the end of the short chute see this cloud of dust through you know straight across of coming out of four a cloud of dust and his flash of red. It was his car. Davy's car was red. And then this explosion. I mean, orange and black smoke, fire, you know, the flames and fire went over 100 feet in the air or more. And the car, it was like drawing a orange and black curtain across the racetrack because his car was gasoline. In fact, he and Eddie were the only two cars in the race burning gasoline. Mm. The rest of us had methanol, you know. And so, anyway, <clears throat> we're coming around turn four and off of the corner, and uh, 
I'm all over my brakes because Eddie's slowing down pretty fast, and and uh, you know the curtain was all the way across to except maybe two feet between Davy's car and the wall, and I could, I, you know, you didn't know what was on the inside through the flames, and and you know, but didn't have time to even make that kind of a move, and. I'm watching Eddie. Eddie had the had a top of his helmet painted with it. It was the first year for the fluorescent orange paint. And he had that. And I can remember seeing him, his head moving from side to side by his roll bar uh, like he was deciding where to go at the last instant. And at the last instant, uh, he just veered left, just barely, you know, just – just enough I saw a gap between the tailpipes and Davy's car sticking out of the flames uh, and between that and, and the wall, outside wall, and I aimed for that. Well, when Eddie impacted Davy, his car reared up in the air, and Eddie's right rear tire put a tire skid mark up the nose of my Watson Roadster about three feet long, and I went under him and up over something. Don't know whether it was Davy or or what, but up over and and back down on the track and came out the other side. Of course, my car had burning gasoline all over it, and uh, I had uh, anyway made it to the first turn. And uh, uh, Bob Vyth came up beside me, and he's he's pointing at me. You know, mm-hmm. wanted me to get off the track. And I didn't know that my – after Unser, well, di- Unser. digress, mm-hmm. Unser had run into the back of uh, Ronnie Duman and caught him on fire, and and Unser came through with the steering knocked out of the Novi. And as I came down out of the flames and, and down, I was down unlocking my transmission to shift it to first gear, and uh, – I hear an engine screaming and look around and here comes Bobby and he hits me in the left rear and that fractured the mount point of my fuel tank and it, I was leaking methanol down the track around and Vyth kept pointing and, and swerving at me and he told me to go in and I said everything's okay and I drove it down and I thought well maybe you know I hadn't experienced any fire yet so I I uh down the back stretch and and uh i thought maybe i ought to check and there was a guy with the you know the speedway pith helmet on and and a fire extinguisher and i just pulled up to him put it in neutral and set the kept the engine running i said is there any fuel leaking out of this thing i yelled at him and he looked around and he said no i said thank you and put it back in gear and drove off and <laughs> and came around to turn four uh you know just up from where the incident happened and uh uh don branson was standing there and he was motioning for me to stop and so i kicked it out of gear and stopped and uh shut everything down the fuel and the switch and unhooked got out of the car and turned around and and the the fuel was was wetting the pavement under my car and making a big uh, puddle and the fire guys came up with fire extinguishers and stood by and i turned around and started up toward the incident and and branson grabbed me by the arm and says you don't want to go up there i was just gonna i was just getting ready to ask you that yeah he don said you don't want to go up there and i said okay don i said my back of my neck feels like it's you know burning is anything there and he looked he said hey you got some got some second degree burns on the back of your neck so when i impacted it threw my head forward and I had raining gasoline mm-hmm. come down on top of, you know, me and everything. <clears throat> and they took me to the, uh, to the hospital and doctored my neck. And I came back to the garage and was there when the car got back and, uh, uh they pushed it in and, and, uh, Herb Porter, my crew chief on the car, uh, and I were standing there and, and he unhooked the, the hood latches and raised the hood up. And uh, we looked in, and there was a lot of uh, looked like sand and pea gravel and a piece of windshield material, uh, corner of the plexiglass windshield material, and and there was a lump there covered up with sand and had 
that looked like a string around it, uh, you know, by it. And Herb reached in and pulled it out and dusted it off, and it was a lemon with a shoestring mm-hmm. pushed through it and, and tied so, you know, have it. And, and Herb looked at it and says, wonder where that came from. And somebody at the door said, oh, my God. Herb said, what? He said, Eddie had that around his neck. Eddie Sachs. Eddie Sachs had that around his neck. And when we impacted, it must have, been hard enough and he he gave an upward motion and it flung off of his neck and in the air and how it got under the hood of my my race car i don't have a clue Wouldn't, whatever happened to it just throw it oh away. I, yeah we just pitched it you know you're, you're walking up on one of the most gruesome and deadly incidents in the history of the race and you're you're involved in it by the grace of God. You're not, you don't perish in it as you're walking back to the pits or you're going to your room that night. Are you thinking, I, I don't know if this is what I want to do to make a living. I just saw two good friends of mine die right in front of me. Do I need to do something else? Surely you jest. And I know your name's not Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> Does that no. give you that? Like, Nope. It's not going to happen to me. And I was lucky enough to come through that one that way. And I have been involved in a few, you know, the rest of the my, my series of racing. So, I you know, I have crashed hard enough in a sprint car to break both arms. And, and uh, I was going to ask you, in 1966, Eldora Speedway in Ohio, you're in this horrible wreck. Wasn't, wasn't really that horrible. It was just uh, I was in Wally Muskowski's new sprint car the one i had the one i had driven to the national sprint car championship in in 65 uh wally built a new car that winter and i was driving it and mario andretti was in in my championship winning car which is a good race car it was one of the best sprint cars i've ever driven and uh but anyway, uh, this, this is where I should note that my uncle Bob Dorn was on yeah. Johnny Rutherford's pit crew for that '65 Sprint Car National yes. Sprint Car Championship. Yes. We had some we had some good times. But uh, anyway, uh, got to you know that trying to put things I. You know, after that incident, uh, there were a lot of other things that that I I just won't talk about. I was in the hospital, Mm. and uh, Davey was on the next table. And uh, but anyway, uh, you know, this business has always been dangerous. Uh, We I've lost a lot of friends in in racing, and uh, it's. Something you just, you know, you say you live with. It's not going to, you know, like I've said earlier and I said it just a little while ago, uh, it's not going to happen to me. Because you have to be fully committed yeah. from a mental and emotional and physical standpoint to be a champion at your level. You can't you can't go into turn one going, oh, my God, what's going to happen here? Yeah. Or in turn yes. two, when my son graduated from high school, uh, my graduation gift to him. My, for my brother and me, um, was the two seater ride around the track. He came out of that car going, I don't know, I think it goes 175 ish, 180, maybe right around there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with a look on his face of, that's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me, ever. And I was like, what's it like? He goes, can we do it again? I'm like, well, it's five hundred dollars. So, yeah. where do you get a? Where do you get your college degree, and then you can do what you want? But, <laughs> but my brother had done it too, and he was actually with Mario. Mario uh-huh. already was his driver, and he said the same thing. It was just like you just can't believe the rush. Yeah, what's it like? What's the rush like? Especially you come there. 63 is your first race. You're in the 140s, 150s. By the time you retire, you're easily over 200 Uh miles an hour did the speed ever make you go how much quicker can we go you don't think about that you just want to go faster if it's available you want to go faster 
And uh, being with McLaren in 73, I set a new track record here that year. And, and that's where you came close to 200, right? To be the we, first person? We, had, we were the first to unofficially go 200 in practice. Mm -hmm. We had made two practice runs at 200 and, and would have been just over 200 miles an hour, 200.1 or two, you know, and, and uh, weather changed. And uh, it was a little different on Saturday, the, the you know, poll day. Sure. And it was, uh, you know, it was the first time I had ever been able to go flat-footed, never lift or touch the brakes around the speedway. Mm. You could, and that was, you know, you got to go flat. You can't lift. If you lift, you lose time. Isn't it Sneva? Isn't that right? Sneva was the first. It was to qualify. the first to qualify. But I, I did that in in seventy. 73 mm -hmm. he did it in 77 78 something like that so we were way ahead of them as far as going fast around here is it fair to say that your your alliance with mclaren changed your career yes i had always told betty if i can find somebody that wants to go racing as badly as i do and win races we'll be winners and that was McLaren, you know, with it, it was kind of, a, they brought the car to the track at a early before May. It was, had to be in, in January or February. And, uh, it was, it was cold around here, but the car we tested for, I think two or three days and we could not get the car to stop under, under steering, pushing. It just, you know, it just wouldn't do it. We tried everything we could here physically to to make the car change attitude, and it wouldn't. And so they left and went back to, to uh, Detroit and uh, to the shop. And I didn't find out until just a year or two ago what happened. But the, the designer of the car... Uh, they took it, sent it back to England, and he redesigned the rear end, the rear suspension on the car, and it was it was different. And they brought the car back to the speedway in May, and uh, <laughs> I couldn't I couldn't believe it. It was balanced, and it, you know, I first time I'd ever gone flat footed all the way around the racetrack, and it was, you know, right at two hundred miles an hour. We talked a little bit before the, the recording started about pole day and what a big deal pole day was um, oh. when I was a kid that I can remember 70s and 80s. I mean, you get a couple hundred thousand people for pole yeah. day. Uh, how important was it for you to win the pole? And do you think, which uh, Johnny Rutherford's our guest, he won the pole in 1973, 1976, and 1980. 76 and 80, he won both the pole and the 500. How important was it to you? And is there an actual advantage to being on the pole? Psychologically, there is an advantage for being on the pole. You're the fastest. But that's like being the fast gun in town. You know, everybody's out to get you. And so it's, but it, that's, yes, it's, that's part of it. Uh, you know, you, you were talking about the number of people that, that used to come out to pole day. Uh, this was known, Indianapolis Motor Speedway was known as, as the largest, the largest attended sporting event in the world. And the second on that list was <laughs> pole day at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And so the, yes, it was, and it was, uh, a big, you know, big thrill. That's what we came here to do was go fast and set on the pole or get our best starting spot. And uh, being on the pole is a gratification. Watching the race on TV, the announcers, whether it was Jim McKay or whomever, uh, would always make a big deal about all the cars making it through lap number one. Like that was super important. Is that something you considered as a driver? It's like, you know, you mentioned about the Sachs-McDonald race happening on lap two. 
but where you're like, okay, let's all the all the professionals we want to get through. Not that everyone's not a professional. Let me say it a different way. All of us with experience know how important the first lap is. Let's hope some of these rookies and less experienced drivers yeah. understand how important lap one is. Did did the did, did the announcers overplay how important that was, or was it something as a driver and a team that you realized this is critical to just get through the first lap with all thirty three cars the way we're lined up? Well, you know, we've we've seen it both ways. We've seen everybody make it through the first and second turn, and and you know, uh, I've done that a lot of times. You know, twenty four times here, I guess. And and going down the back stretch, uh, it's pretty amazing to see them lined up five and six wide, mm. jockeying for positions in a five hundred mile race on the first <laughs> lap, uh, one of two hundred. So, you know, you wonder how brainy they are when it, when it <laughs> comes down to, to uh, you know, being, being in the action and, and racing. But uh, it's, you know, like that, like that 70, 74 in the McLaren starting pole in the ninth row, 25th. And in, in 12 laps, I was running third. Well, that's how good the car was, you know, and I, I – the driver gets to take advantage of what the car will give him. Do you have a favorite Indianapolis 500 tradition? Tradition? Besides Johnny Rutherford pulling into victory lane. That's that's <laughs> number that's one. The best one. <laughs> yes. Uh, like, like, are you conscious of, you know, if, if you don't get misty eyed when uh, taps is played or Jim neighbors singing, you know, back home yeah. again in Indiana and, and all the things that happen, the balloons, all that. Is there anything that you particularly look forward to as a driver, or are you just oblivious at that point? You're you're focused. You're you're totally focused. You know, you're you're in the car. Your belts are hooked. They're right. Everything is has just like you've been practicing all month. And you're you're sitting in there. Nothing. There's no hard points. You're you're comfortable. You have worked all month on getting the seat just right, and and you, everything is in the right place and and you uh you're waiting for that command you know to start engines and uh uh from that point it's you know being able to stay in line and and do what you know think about i used to take the the page out of the sports page uh of the uh, indianapolis star and and they had all 33 mm-hmm cars you know drivers you know the the picture of the drivers and the, their speeds and so on and i used to get that uh for out of the paper and the night before the race i would study where i was and and who was around me who was up front who was behind who is he going to try to charge by or you know what's That's going a great on? point and anyway i would look at that and and try to uh, embroil it in my brain so that I that's what I looked for when the race started. How often do you think about uh, the races you thought you should have won oh. and didn't? <laughs> should have, would have, could have. You know, yeah. I, well, I, I've said this I, before in other podcast interviews where you watch documentaries about sports, especially, right? And these superstars, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, you know, name the list, football, tennis, whatever. And they spend a lot of time talking about the ones they didn't win. Like when I'm in the elevator by myself, I think about the shot I missed in this game that could have won. Like, well, wait a second, but you won all these championships. Yeah, well, whatever. Yeah. I'm thinking about this one. Do those disappointments stick with you? And is there a particular year where you think you should have had it and you didn't? Oh, here in Indy. He has always shoulda, woulda, coulda. You know, I uh, I won my first race in 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 seventy four. Uh, had we not cracked an exhaust header in seventy three, I I was strong enough that we might have done that. Might have won that one. Coulda. Coulda, woulda, shoulda. But we didn't. But uh, the 75, 
uh, we were long gone again. Unser was running second. Bobby Unser was running second. And got down to last pit stop. And Tyler Alexander, my crew chief, said, let's let's stop. We need to make a pit stop so we can, you know, know for sure we'll go to the end of the race. So I pit stopped. Well, the sky over Terre Haute was black, headed this way. And, and Unser was still running, leading, and I was in second. And I don't know when he would have had to make his pit stop, but he had to make a pit stop. And if the rain had not come, then he would have pit stopped and I would have taken the lead and I would have, as it would have turned out, I won again in 74 because of the rain. Mm -hmm. It stopped the race and they couldn't get it ready to run on the track again and, and call the race and I was the first to win the shortest race in history at the 500, 102 laps instead of 200. But I won that race. I would have been the first three race in a row winner. Right. And then had I come back in, in 80 with, with Jim Hall and the Chaparral and won, I would have been a four-time winner. <laughs> <laughs> well, the 75 race is the one that I was thinking of when I asked that question. I don't mean to bring up a bad memory, but it, it yeah. just seems to be a common theme among champions that they tend to dwell on the ones that got away. Let me tell you a funny story about that. After the race, I was interviewed and I said, had it not rained, I, I would have won that race. Well, Bobby Unser took exception to that, and he was upset with me, you know, and it was, it, it was incredible. He wouldn't talk to me. He, he was telling bad stories about me and everything. Really? And, and so, anyway, the next year we came back here, and uh, I, <laughs> I was at another meeting, and, uh, you know, and I— I was talked talking same same one is a good year had a had a gathering of the drivers from the year previous on and uh, I said you know I I still believe that had it gone the distance I I would have won the race but I said when you open the 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 record books a hundred years from now the name on that's going to be in number one is Bobby Unser he won this race and that was it. Mm. Well, short time after that, we were, I was out walking down pit, down pit lane up to the North and I have feel this arm around my shoulder and it's Bobby Unser making up. <laughs> <laughs> Did he concede like, you know, Jr. You probably would have been right because I nope. had to pit. No, and you had oh no, he wouldn't do that. He wouldn't. No. It was just like you finally saw the light. Yes, he. Yeah, I. Yeah, I saw the light. Right. <laughs> We're the Leaders and Legends podcast, talking with racing legend and Hall of Famer. He, you're in more Hall of Fames. I can't even. I don't even have them all written down, but they're like five, oh. and deservedly so for an I, amazing career. Uh, you mentioned Bobby Unzer. Uh, I think one of the best things about the racing in the in the seventies and eighties, which is kind of my time period was the Titanic list of drivers, Mario Andretti, Al Unzer, Bobby Unzer, Gordon, John Cock, Johnny Rutherford, AJ Foyt, of course. And then, you know, Rick Mears kind of comes in the next generation. Yeah. Did you feel like you had a particular rival and it, were there certain drivers whose skills you admired maybe more like, you know, on a dirt track, this is the guy or in, you know, in a close race, this is the guy. But did you think like, I want to beat driver X or is it just about winning and it's not relative just, to anyone just, else? No, not relative to anyone else. It's, uh, uh, of course, you know, you, you're, you're talking about that list. You just, just rattled off there. Uh, AJ Foyt is probably still, 
the best driver uh, on dirt, on pavement. He's won sports car races. He's won stock car races. He's won Indy car races, midget races, sprint car races. Uh, Daytona, the Daytona 500, I believe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He and Mario both won the. Yeah. Well, yes. And he's won Le Mans. Mm-hmm. So he, he he's. You know, I, I he's my hero. He's the guy, and he's a dear friend. Lives in Houston. I live in in Fort Worth, and so, you know, it's uh, you know, we we get together and talk and and kick over old old bones and <laughs> anyway. But we but would there love were the to others, have him as yeah, a guest the others the were the podcast. others were as good, and I I relate Parnelli Jones as one of the top three drivers that i've ever raced against he uh, he could win in anything he crawled in and uh, mario was was exceptional al unser al unser was you know i made a statement one time years ago uh that if i was a car owner and i wanted the best driver that i could get al unser would be it Al was it was very good. If you had the right people working the, working on the car and and uh, uh, helping doing what he you know each driver has the things he wants done and and it's the comfort uh, range of the car and the and the balance of the car and the things that we we work on and uh, but Al was very good and he's he's won a lot of races and and you know, four time winner here. Is it fair to say 19? I'm going to, and I want to read this cause I'm going to get your answer, but 1980 was Johnny Rutherford's year. He won the season opener at the Ontario motor speedway. He dominated the month of May here in Indianapolis, earning the pole position. He led 118 out of 200 laps to claim his third Indianapolis 500 victory he won five races that year and the Cart Indy Car Championship. And the USAC Indy Car Championship. I'm the only driver in history of racing to win both of them in one year. How did it all come together that year? It was it was great. Uh Jim Hall uh had this the chaparral and he brought it here in in seventy nine and Al Unser was driving it. And he did he and win it, that year, it right? It got here no, mm-hmm. it got here seven or eight days before the race. Mm. And that that is a that's tough to handle. You know, to take a brand new race car, you've never it's never rolled a wheel and and go out there. Well they had they had a gearbox problem. And uh, overheated, and that was that was you know out out of the race. And he ran it all season. Uh, they had they got it to where he could work with it at Phoenix, the last race of the season, and he won the race with the car. But uh, Al and Jim had a falling out about who Jim wanted to keep to work on the car. And Al wanted some of the mechanics before to to stay there. Well, he didn't. Well, that was the same time that McLaren uh, was going back to England and doing Formula One, mm-hmm. period, you know. And so uh, Tyler Alexander, my crew chief at McLaren, called Jim and, and said, you, you know, if you need a driver, you better hire Rutherford. And so Jim called me and we hammered out a deal and we went to test the car in, uh, I think it was February of, uh, of uh, 80 and got to Phoenix and they had the car set up just like Al had driven it and won the race. The car scared me to death. (laughs) <laughs> you know, it just did wobbly and, and, you know, it, it, you know, I just, it, I worked with it till, you know, we, we changed everything, but the paint job, uh, until about noon and we had lunch and then came back and Steve Roby had been one of my mechanics at McLaren 
And he said, Jim, I, I, can I try some things with the car that I know that Rutherford likes? Jim said, sure. You know, <laughs> we, we don't know what else to do. So he put some, some stiffer springs so we could lower the car right down and take real advantage of the ground effects and some other things and uh, found out that the, the car over the track was pulling down on the under tray or the bottom of the car and grinding through the, the, the uh, carbon fiber. And so they, they fixed some things, and I went out. <clears throat> and before we finished that day, we were two seconds a lap under the track record. That's how strong mm-hmm. that car was. The only time I had to lift the car, all, you know, back off the throttle any, was just to, to transfer weight to the right front to get it around the narrower turn one and two at, mm-hmm. at Phoenix. When you when you got it set and you took bumped the curve, you just nailed it, and you didn't lift till you came back around to there to do that again. You threw the th- third and fourth turn was flat chat, and there was so much lateral G that it made me grunt, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, holding the holding the car in the in the corner. Best car you've ever driven? Uh, I it would that would be uh best ground effects car I'd ever driven. The uh, M16 McLaren flat bottom car was was as good for what it was as the as the Chaparral. Chaparral was in a new realm. That's a whole new world for for driving a race car because it is it is so tight, you know, to the ground when it's upright and doing, you know, it's wow. You just go flat out. Let me go back to another, uh, something I wanted to ask when we were talking about other drivers as we wrap up the podcast, and that is when the drivers came over from Europe, how were they treated? How were they looked upon? Was it like, come on over here and try this? Or was there a little bit of kind of Ryder Cup rivalry to it? You mean the Wops or Limeys? <laughs> <laughs> or the Scots or the... Uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> no, that it they're welcome you know it's like like you know uh women drivers janet guthrie for god's sake who was your if, teammate in certain races yeah and and it's you know if if they can pass the tests and show that they have the, they can handle it sure why not you know that's that's it's the same for everybody mm-hmm. so it's uh now it it you know uh when they came over, uh, they brought a lot of knowledge. Some of them did about the the rear engine independent suspended cars. The I was involved in in a couple of the uh, early uh, builders' attempts at building a rear engine independent suspended car, and the one that Herb Porter uh, put together. Boy, it, it was scary to drive. You know, it had a Chevrolet in it, and uh, he had the first Chevrolet dirt car, championship dirt car that I drove. Boy, and it was strong. And uh, But anyway. Scary and strong meaning like fast or just better? Just, uh, well, I sat on the front row or the pole four races, that four dirt races that season. Mm-hmm. And I sat on the pole with it uh, the last dirt race at Langhorn which everybody shudders when you mention the name Langhorn. You know, it was a big full circle, and you run flat out with a dirt car. And uh, But anyway, uh, no, it, it uh, you know, you just took it as it came, I guess. that's As, as memory serves, you did Pennzoil commercials? Is it, yeah. You, all right. Yeah. I think you were driving a Cadillac. In the Pennzoil commercials, so I think that they were you were in this nice car. I remember it was a big Chrysler. Is that what it was? Yeah. But it's this beautiful, nice car, and this is the early '80s, right? And I remember thinking, so I'm going to take this opportunity to ask you because uh, who knows if I'll get a chance to ask another driver of your caliber again? How the hell do you drive on the interstate? How do I drive on the like, interstate? How do you drive when there's these 
these drivers around who don't know what the hell they're doing and don't use their turn signal and flip you off. And you're not going fast enough. Like when you're next to Mario Andretti and AJ Foyt and Bobby Unzer, and then, you know, and then you're next to Jim Bob and Robert Vane and Chris Spangle. Are you like, will you clowns get out of my way? Like, how do you deal with that as a professional driver? It's two different worlds. You know, racing is, is one thing and you, you, uh, you, you do whatever the car will give you to do. And on the interstate, you know, I drove from Texas to Indianapolis uh, last Tuesday and uh, took me 17 hours from Fort Worth to here. Had to stop twice, three times for fuel. But, uh, you know, it's just, it's a different world, a different trip. Uh, you don't, you know, people that want to mess around and and everything you just watch them and say well you know it's like davy going by me and and across the short shoot shoot in in uh in the sick in uh, that race have you ever passed someone on the freeway uh going fast and had somebody yell who the hell do you think you are johnny rutherford <laughs> no <laughs> well that's what i'm gonna say the next but time. i <laughs> i had an officer i <clears throat> I had a, uh, I can't even remember what, well, I think it was a Camaro maybe or something. And I was on city streets in River Oaks in Texas where I live. It's a suburb of Fort Worth. And I, you know, came around and it was a straight shot and I just legged it, you know. Well, Mr. Do Right was sitting just around the corner where I went zimming by. And uh, anyway, he pulled out and the light on. I saw it just jammed on the brakes, pulled over and stopped. He came up. I had my license out and everything and uh, handed it to him. And uh, he looked at it. He looked at me. He said, just keep it on the track, okay? (laughs) And I said, yes, sir, thank you. (laughs) And a few years later, was driving... uh, on the interstate going to through Ohio and an officer pulled me over. I wasn't going that fast, but anyway, he pulled me over and, uh, it was several years after I had done my thing here and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Didn't recognize the name, wrote me a nice ticket and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Time marches on. <laughs> You have been invited, one of the things I've noticed in reading about you, you've been invited to the White House on several occasions. Yes. What was that like, and who invited you, and were they all race fans? It was, it was, yes, it's it's wonderful. Everybody ought to get a chance to go have a black tie dinner in the, in the you know, uh, in the East Wing. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yes, I, I, Betty and I were there six times for six different presidents. And uh, uh, I was there for, uh, oh, Jimmy Carter, and he had Willie Nelson and his band there. And, uh, you know, it was nice. And we, the, the one was, uh, was really kind of set up by J.C. Agajanian yeah. during Nixon's time in the office. And he brought, they brought in... A, all kinds of racers, Jackie Stewart and, you know, for, uh, Formula One racers, drag racers, you know, people from all sorts of motorsports and uh, got to meet the, the president. And, and uh, yeah, it was it was good, you know, enjoyable. Uh, Ronald Reagan was was uh, one of the nicest and uh, he was a big race fan. You know, he did. He announced races in his early career early life and uh, but it was you know uh it was uh it was well the bushes are from texas so did you get to go for either of the bush white house years yes yes george bush in fact i knew both i know both of them knew both sure uh george senior is he's uh uh passed away but he was he was a great guy a great guy he was at he was at the uh, all of the induction ceremonies for the sports motorsports Hall of Fame at Talladega, 
and uh, he was at the dinner, and Smokey Eunuch, who could not hear, mm-hmm. you know, he had he was so deaf from his dino and everything. Uh, he was he was sitting across the table from me, and we, and we had visited, and uh, you know, and uh, he couldn't say anything without yelling it because he had to hear what he was saying Mm -hmm. and uh george bush president 41 i guess was was introduced and then they brought up the uh, guy to do the invocation uh, for the for the lunch and he he was getting up and everybody was very quiet and smoky (laughs) smoky yell Boy, John, this is some shindig, isn't it? <laughs> the president doubled over laughing. <laughs> we asked the same five questions of all our guests, and it's our honor to ask Johnny Rutherford these questions. Are you ready? Yeah. Number one, what was your first job? My first job? Uh... Well, I've had I've had several during my my career. One of the one of the summer jobs that I had uh, when school let out is I got a job at Montgomery Wards in Fort Worth, which is was a huge building. Mm-hmm. But the second floor was catalog orders, and I got a job there filling catalog orders. And we did it on roller skates <laughs> with with wooden wheels. You know, they didn't have the all this nice, neat stuff they have today. Mm-hmm. But we'd skate, you know, to the aisle. We'd know where the aisle was that we had to go get the product. Slide sideways and take off. And, of course, the, the flat spots on the wheels were thump, 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 <laughs> you know. But that was one of my early jobs. What was your first concert? First concert? Mm-hmm. Did they have concerts back then? Well, how about the first one you can remember? <laughs> oh, gosh. I don't know. Uh, might. Oh. Was it Jim Neighbors singing Back Home Again in Indiana? No. <laughs> that that was one. Jim was a dear friend mm-hmm. of Betty's and mine. And uh, uh, I was trying to think. Man, it might have been a... Uh, Willie Nelson uh, event, yeah, you know, years ago. Willie's Willie's brother went to school. I went to school with him in in Fort Worth at Northside High School. Oh, you're kidding? Yeah. If you could r- suggest any book for someone to read, which book would you recommend? Well, it de- you know that depends on what it is, but uh, Lone Survivor. Uh, is is one that I you know it's a, it's about the Navy SEAL that that uh, was nearly killed by the Taliban and and uh, uh, had made it, but his three men with him were were killed in the battles over there. But uh, uh, that's a good one. That's a that's a good one. But there's another one that's written by Bob Lutz. Who was was president of General Motors and Chrysler and and you know a brilliant man. He's he's written a book called uh, Oh why am I drawing a blank? But anyway, it was the the uh, about all of the the strong famous people in business. And how good they were, or how bad they were. Sure. Yeah, it was sure. it was good book. Icons and idiots. The icons and idiots. <laughs> yeah, that was that was I enjoyed Thank that you, because mm-hmm. Bob Lutz was one of my uh, celebrity pace car drivers that I trained here. Oh yeah, because you driven the pace car several times. Oh yes, 500. a lot of lot of a lot of years. But uh, anyway, he was. He was a Marine, you know, he was a Marine fighter pilot, Marine, Marine Corps fighter pilot. And uh, he was, it was something. He, most of them had never, the the, the people in the, you know, that, that were 
brought in to to uh, be the pace car celebrity pace car drivers had not driven that fast before uh general colin powell had a corvette so he knew what it was like but we went out and i i show i drive around the track and then i let them get in and they drive around and we'd do a start i'd say okay we start here speed limit this is that and and do the three laps coming in and we're coming off four you're you're supposed to be doing about 120 miles an hour at least to stay ahead of the race cars and and into the into the pit lane well we colin powell was running right we were 120 130 and he came around the corner and drove right by pit lane right on down the front straightaway (laughs) i said i said general you just missed the pits and he got a big grin on his face and looked at me. He said, I guess I was just having too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> but Lutz, Lutz, you know, being a Marine Corps fighter pilot and everything and, and uh, where he is positioned in, in life, uh, most of them tend to want to say, oh, there's where I want to go and twitch the wheel. Well, you don't do that going that fast with any car and it can create problems. But anyway, <clears throat> he kept doing that. We come around, turn four at 130 mile an hour in that big Chrysler uh, pace car they had that year, mm-hmm. and and he would he would come in and and it make the car really wobble because he was you know steering it that way. Well, finally we we did it two or three times, and he and he did it the same way every time, and we got it turned and off and. I just started yelling at him, Bob, stop, Bob, stop, stop the car. And he stopped it in the pit entrance to the pit lane. And I said, <clears throat> Bob, you, you've got to quit wanking this thing around. I said, the last thing in the world you want to do is spin this thing out in front of all the people on television or the fans in the stands are the 33 greatest drivers in the world. And I said, you just want to get it straight and be very smooth and deliberate. And he sat there looking straight ahead the whole time. And he finally snapped his head over and looked at me and says, okay, let's do it again. And he did it perfect. Mm. So there's, you know, there's just a whole lot of enjoyed. I enjoyed training the, the celebrities to drive the pace car. Fourth question. If you could witness any event in history, be there in person as it happens, which event would you choose? Ooh. I don't know. That's, that's kind of a kind of, (laughs) kind of hard to do since you've been to the biggest one in the world, the Indianapolis motor speedway. And uh, I think maybe, uh, uh, I don't know. I, I that's that's a tough question. You know, I think maybe uh well here we you know we're the greatest spectacle in podcasts, so you know, we want to yes, try to make that, them tough. Yeah. Constitutional convention, surrender at Yorktown, uh signing of the Declaration of Independence. I think <clears throat> being a being a Texan, I think probably be in, in Las Vegas for the, in November for the rodeo finals. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. If you could have dinner with anyone living today, living today, two hours off the record, whom would you choose? I think the president of the United States. I would like to, you know, He's doing he's doing a good job. It's just that people don't seem to uh, maybe understand uh, the problems and the things, you know, and with this pandemic, you know, it's it's this has not been easy. Right. Tell you a little story. Foyt and I were talking about a week ago. I called him and, and he gave me his usual leave your number and if uh, and i might call you back you know so <laughs> i waited and he called me back and uh we talked and i said you know this 
this crazy uh, virus thing's going to last a long time. And he said, yeah, yes, it, it, I think so, too. And there was a pause, and he said, and Rutherford, as old as we are, we may not see the end of this thing. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, that's mm. kind of the, the way it is with this terrible thing that's that's disrupted everything in the world right yeah just totally out of whack as we're about to run we as the indianapolis motor speedway is about to run a race with no fans yeah which is shocking you have been listening to leaders and legends a podcast presented by veteran strategies a local veteran public relations enterprise and sponsored by girl scouts of central indiana garmond construction the Crown Plaza Hotel, Grand Hall, and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Our guest has been three-time Indianapolis 500 champion and Hall of Famer Johnny Rutherford, you have been so kind, so gracious with your time. It's an absolute thrill. I met you one time about 30 years ago, <laughs> and we had a brief encounter at a hotel I was working at because you needed to know where a meeting room was. You were just as nice then as you have been now. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. Mm-hmm.